Thank you, friends. Well, it was the Jewish philosopher and theologian, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who said that most of what the Bible commands of us could be summed up in one imperative. Remember. And we know remembrance is a powerful thing, our ability to conjure up stories and events of the past that help frame our current perspective and dictate our actions. We've named that remembrance is at the heart of why we are here this evening to tell those powerful stories of our faith that might nudge us to deeper faith and action in Christ. Uh, Pastor David offered for us just a second ago one of those powerful stories where Jesus and his disciples towards the end of his ministry were in Jerusalem during the festival of unleavened bread. And it said that Jesus longed to share the Passover meal with his disciples and asked them to prepare that. You heard that story. Now, if you're not familiar with this sacred tradition of Jewish custom, the Passover meal is often called the Seder. And it consists of several different pieces of food that are intended to be partaken of in community to move those people through a powerful story of God's provision when God's providential hand moved and freed the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, out of the bondage and captivity they were in in Egypt under Pharaoh. And we learn through the Seder meal the movements of the story. If you were to partake in a Seder now, you would hear accounts of God's demand of Pharaoh to let God's people go and upon Pharaoh's heart being hardened that God unleashed plague upon plague upon plague to the land of Egypt culminating in the angel of death coming to take the children of Egypt and God's promise that if the Israelites would sacrifice a lamb and place the blood over the door jam that the angel of death would pass over them. You would also hear stories about their dramatic escape from the land of Egypt, how it seemed like all hope was lost. The Israelites were getting pushed up against the border of the sea and Pharaoh's army was after them when God allowed Moses to part the Red Sea, allowing the Israelites to walk on dry land through it and leaving Pharaoh's army sinking, not swimming. These are powerful stories that remind God's people of God's commitment to them to remind them of God's provision day after day and his fidelity to us. And God's people tell these stories again and again and again. Because as powerful as the message is, the sad thing is, it's so easy to forget God's provision for us. And so I want to highlight that in one of the stories from Exodus. I'm going to read some scripture for you. This comes from that story just after the ancient Israelites have escaped Egypt and passed the Red Sea. And now they are moving towards God's promised land for them. And they are wandering through the wilderness to get there. And although they have seen the powerful acts of God... They're starting to get a little anxious about the journey ahead. So hear now with me this portion of the story. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of God in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread... For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. 
And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness and saw the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And can you imagine that? You wake up in the morning, you walk outside your tent to get a breath of fresh air and crunch. You look down at the ground and there seems to be this strange substance everywhere. You rub your eyes and kind of look out in the distance you check and your neighbor's doing the same thing, scoping it out. And you say to him, hey, Frank, what is it? And in Hebrew, that question sounds like this. Mana. And manna becomes its name. What is it? It's daily bread. What is it? It's enough for today, what is it? It's a sign and symbol of that truth we spoke about. God provides. And you would think that these ancient Israelites would have known that by now. We, see, we said that we saw how they went, uh, God went to bat for them. But that was several chapters ago in the story. And as the discomfort and uncertainty of being in the wilderness start to set in, they start to second guess that truth. They're hangry. Their memory is shorter. And their physical needs now are more tangible than that spiritual hope that Moses keeps preaching to him. And the complaints start coming to God. You heard the ones about their leaders. They're annoyed, exhausted, frustrated, afraid. And so the people of God there in the wilderness gather around and start throwing a good old pity party. And if you've ever been to one, I've hosted several. You will know that the conversations in those are not necessarily life-giving. And the ancient Israelites start reframing their story. I can hear the conversation in my head. Hey, Frank, was it true that we passed through the middle of the Red Sea? Or is that just an illusion? It is hot out here, and where is God? And so you see how this lack of, of clarity, the anxiety and worry, begins to erode the memory of these ancient ancestors of ours. They start assuming that the plan all along had been perhaps to lead them out into the wilderness and starve them to death. But before we pass judgment on them, consider for me a moment how this is true in our living as well. Is it not true that the worries and anxieties of our daily life start to whittle away at our memory about all the good work God has been doing behind the scenes in our world. How our amazement and joy are replaced by anxiety and concern for self-preservation in these chaotic times we live in. And so I must confess that I can relate to those conversations on a hungry stomach in the wilderness asking where God is, second-guessing God's providence and provision, I confess that this on, unending onslaught of daily stress makes me wonder and be a bit wishy-washy about this faith 
that we carry in our God. Well, you heard the good news for the ancient Israelites and for us that in this case, God's provision is not predicated on the consistency of our faithfulness. Thanks be to God. Because God was not going to let God's people starve in that wilderness. And it seems that God just keeps giving us what we need to sustain us for the journey. God keeps doing it day by day, whether we see it and are grateful for it or not. So, wakes up and God has given them manna. But there's some rules that go along with manna. After the story we read, there's instruction. The first was that it must be collected each morning fresh. Nothing was to be squirreled away or stockpiled for the second day. If someone tried to hoard it for the next day, well, it would rot. The worms would get a hold of it. It was no good. Try to hoard God's gifts, and they rot. Sound familiar? You see, the idea was that God would provide for God's people day by day. God was looking for a people that were committed to trusting in God's faithfulness to them. But you know how that goes. We say that, and then we start reading the internet, and then we hear the newscast, and then we think about what energy the work week's going to require, and maybe we start stockpiling Maybe thinking, well, what if God has a sick day or decides to bail on this whole mess of humanity that we're reading about? It was daily bread. God wants people that believe that God will provide each day, not once in a blue moon, not annually or monthly. Daily bread. The second caveat to this man is very similar to the first, that the persons must gather what they truly need, an honest assessment of what sustains us. And so the story goes that those who tried to gather up too much, who had too big of eyes or too big of a, a satchel to put it in, well, it seemed like they came up short. And those that shared and even took a little less than maybe they needed, well, when push came to shove... They never seemed to want for more. And so we learned something else about this manna. It wasn't just for a few people who had a big appetite. It was for everyone. It wasn't my manna. It was us, ours, our daily bread. So flash forward with me several centuries because there's this boy in, in Nazareth, and he's learning about this story in Sunday school. Jesus is his name, and he's learned the text. He's committed it to heart. He's remembered the story with his people. And so when he's training his disciples to pray, he trains them this way. He says, ask God to give us this day our daily bread. The question is, Do you see, friends, that daily bread? That which sustains us? Those things which appear day by day in their little obscure ways. They, they line the landscape of our day with just enough sweetness and substance to keep us going. Keep one foot in front of another. It's the smell of the coffee in the morning. It's the smile of a child in the evening. The caring touch of a friend, a, a kiss from a loved one, a text message of compliment, a, a scripture passage of encouragement, a laugh shared over a meal. It's a song that touches the heart, a moment of silence away from the crowd, a whiff of spring flowers on the wind, a small voice within you saying, all will be well. Silently, friends, that manna preaches its sermons to us. It says, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel just yet. There's reason for hope. 
In fact, there are 10,000 little morsels of evidence to believe that God is making a way for us through the wilderness of our living and that God will continue to provide us with what we truly need to see us through on this journey. And what is that? Well, it's enough for this day. What is it? It's our daily bread. And so friends, for that daily bread, I invite you now to join your voices, mine, with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray for that bread. Will you join me in the Lord's Prayer now? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.